Welcome back, everybody. Um, we're going to talk in this lecture uh, about a concept called center of mass, um, which is uh, not technically a concept which is about, or not technically uh, directly related to uh, momentum, but it is closely related to momentum ideas. Uh, many textbooks cover center of mass uh, in with the momentum chapter. Uh, in our particular textbook, center of mass actually gets discussed right at the beginning of rotation, solid body rotation. So if you're looking for this in your textbook, it's uh, right at the beginning of chapter 12, not in chapter 11 where the rest of this uh, is covered. Uh, center of mass will be one of the things that's on uh, midterm three, along again with collisions and momentum and impulse. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and talk about it here, um, and uh, and there we go. So that's what this lecture is about. Um, to define what center of mass is, well, we can go through some examples here, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll show you sort of what it means, but uh, you can think of center of mass in a number of ways. It is, um, it is technically the, uh, the, uh, the sort of the mass-weighted center of an object. Um, it's the place uh, around which an object will balance. Uh, so, for instance, if I have this pen, I can balance this pen, uh, <laughs> sort of, at one point uh, by supporting it under its center of mass. Um, let me, here's another object I could balance by a single finger by supporting it under its center of mass. You'll notice that it's in the middle of the calculator that way and also uh, in the middle of the calculator this way. Um, and uh, here's another object. Um, and uh, here we could hang the object. Uh, if I hang this cup here, excuse me, if I hang this cup uh, by a point, uh, it will dangle such that its center of mass uh, is somewhere, this is tricky to do on the computer screen, it's going to be somewhere on the vertical line here underneath uh, the place where it's supported. So somewhere in here, probably about there, is the center of the mass of our cup. Um, it's got a closely related concept of center of gravity, and in the context of most of the things that we're going to talk about in this course, center of mass and center of gravity will really be essentially in the same place. Um, the distinction between center of mass and center of gravity is subtle. Center of mass is literally the mass-weighted average position in an object, whereas center, gravity, center of gravity would be the weight-weighted center of an object. In other words, the only difference between center of mass and center of gravity is that center of gravity depends on the gravitational force, uh, and the only time it would be different is if the gravitational force is changing significantly across the object. And since here on the planet Earth the gravitational force at the surface changes pretty slowly, the distinction between center of mass and center of gravity is usually not something you have to worry about. If you're talking a large skyscraper or something very, very tall on the surface of the planet Earth, then there's a slight difference between center of mass and center of gravity. But like I said, in the context of this course, uh, they're fairly interchangeable ideas. So how do we calculate where this center of mass is. Well, let's start with a very, very simple system. Uh, two objects of equal mass um, separated by some distance. So there's two different position vectors. And um, the obvious intuitive thing to say would be that, well, the center of this system is halfway between the two masses. And that will turn out to, in fact, be correct. What we can do is then say, 
All right. Uh, there it is. The, ha the af halfway point in the center of mass is the average position, if you will, in our system. All right. So the center of a system of equal masses is just the average of the individual positions, right? We take position 1, x1, plus position 2, and divide by the number of particles, right? So if, if it's been a while since you for, or forgot how to do averages, you add everything up and then divide by the number of things. But what if the masses are unequal? What if one of those masses is heavier than the other? So in this case, what if we have a mass m1 over here and a mass or sorry, mass m over here and a mass 2m over here, um, well, then we would kind of think that this one is going to matter more than that one. So maybe over here would be the center of this system. If one end of the pen was heavier than the other, or take, for instance, this spoon, the center of, uh, the center of mass of the spoon is going to be closer to the part of the spoon that has more metal, so it's going to be closer over here, and indeed you can balance the spoon. You have to get much closer uh, to uh, the, the, the shovel end of the spoon than the handle end of the spoon, because there's more stuff over here and less stuff over here, and so we have to be closer to the more stuff, to the heavier end of the spoon. So we would expect here that the center of mass is going to be closer to the heavier mass. So again, those are the two positions. And the way that we calculate the center of mass for uneven masses is that it's equal to the mass weighted average of individual positions. So if you haven't uh, done an average weighting, uh, if you've never figured out, for instance, how to calculate the grades in this class where different uh, parts of the grade book are weighted differently, um, then we, we introduce this weighting system. So the center of mass, instead of just being adding up all the positions and dividing by the number of objects, we add up masses of each object times its position and then divide by the total mass. So this business of where we multiply each thing by a weight, in this case the weight is the mass of that thing, this is what we do or we'll call taking a weighted average. Even the naming here suggests center of mass, center of gravity. Um, so in this case, we would have to say um, that that is uh, m times x1 plus 2m times x2, right? So that's going to give us uh, m times x1 plus 2m times x2, right? And then divide by the total mass which in this case is going to be m plus 2m, or 3m, and hopefully our camera will stop freaking out and catch up with us. Um, and so m times x1 plus 2, 2m times x2 divided by 3m, that's where we're going to find the center of mass of this system. So not in the middle, but closer over here to, uh, to the edge. Indeed, uh, in, in this case, it's going to be uh, two-thirds of the way between uh, the two objects. And we can continue this process for more than one object, or more than one pair of objects, uh, for a system made of particles we can add up the, uh, each particle's mass, add them all together, and find that the center of mass is, again, where you take a mass-weighted average of each, each particle in the system and divide by the total mass of the system. Um, and to find the center of a system in multiple dimensions, you do this. You find the center of mass coordinate in the x direction the center of mass coordinate in the y direction. If you want to do it in three dimensions, you can do this same thing in, in z as well. 
Um, again, this is just a mass weighted averaging. It's, it's exactly like what we do in the grade book when we calculate, uh, you know, the tests are worth so much, the midterm, or the final exam is worth so much, the homeworks are worth whatever they're worth, and so on. You, you take each different category and multiply that category by the weighting of that category, and that's how you calculate the average across the course. Here, we do the same thing, uh, except that we're calculating the average mass-weighted position in our object. Um, and we can even continue this, uh, what if our object isn't made up of discrete particles? Well, technically all objects are made up of discrete particles at the atomic level, but we don't have to actually go all the way down to the atomic level and count every single atom in a system to find the center of mass. Um, we can also divide up our ob solid object into small cells of little mass delta m, and do the typical thing we do in calculus, uh, let that little delta m get very, very small and turn it into a dm, and then we can turn those sums of the previous page, we can turn these sums into an integral, one over the mass times the integral of x times your little dm, and one over the mass times the integral of y times these little dms, and we have to integrate across these d masses. We're going to have to turn this dm into some expression using dx and dy. We're going to have to be careful about where we're doing the limits of integration, and I'll do a, an example or two that sort of illustrates how this works. Indeed, let's do an example right here. So we'll start with a very simple example of how to deal with this um, uh, in the continuum case. So it says, what's the center of mass of a uniform density square with sides of length L? So we have our square here with a side L and a side L. Um, and we can imagine breaking that square up into a whole bunch of little uh, dx's and dy's. And um, uh, then to calculate the area, for instance, of this square, we would integrate uh, along the x direction and integrate along the y direction, do a double integral. Um, <coughs> And uh, to turn this into a dm, uh, we would have to take our dA. So our dA is typically going to be dx dy uh, for a case like this, where we're integrating in Cartesian coordinates. And if we multiply by that, that by some density, so in this case it's a surface mass density, which means if you multiply it by an area, it gives you a mass. So the units of this thing would be kilograms per square meter, for instance. Uh, that would be the, the density, the surface density of this. And to find the center of mass in the x-coordinate, or the x-coordinate of the center of mass, it's going to be 1 over the mass of our square. And then we're going to integrate in x's. So we're going to slice the square into strips like this and sort of scan those strips across the square. So we're going to go from 0 to L in the x direction um, and uh, we're going to integrate density times uh, x but to turn this density into a mass, we also have to have an area. And uh, dx isn't an area, dx is a piece of a line. But uh, if we integrate dx, or if we multiply dx by the length of that strip, which we know is just going to be L, but I'm going to go ahead and pretend that we don't know that. Uh, well, that way we could find the length of this strip by, again, integrating up along that strip. So that'll be an integral from 0 to L in Y. 
but we're just trying to find the area of that strip, but not the mass of that strip. So we don't have to multiply by a second uh, density here. Um, and then uh, we're also going to integrate this whole thing here, this integral in dx. All right, so um, this integral, as we already said, is just going to tell us the length of that strip. That's just going to give us L, right? So this is 1 over m times the integral from 0 to L of sigma L x dx. So we evaluated this integral of y and just got the length L or the height of our, our square. Sigma and L are both constants. We can pull them out of the integral so that we can rewrite here the, the center of mass coordinate uh, in the x direction is going to be sigma L over m times the integral of x dx, again from 0 to L, and the integral of x dx is x squared over 2, um, and we're going to have to evaluate that from 0 to L. Well, at 0, this is 0, so it's really only the we replace the x squared with the L, and we can say that this is sigma L over m times L squared over 2. Now, the area of this square is L squared, and the mass of that square is sigma times the area, so it's sigma L squared. So we could replace this, xcm is equal to sigma L over sigma L squared times L squared over 2, and the sigmas cancel and the L squareds cancel, and we're left with that the center of mass coordinate in the x direction is L over 2. In other words, the center of mass is going to be somewhere along the line that cuts uh, the square in half horizontally. This is not a surprising result. I'm sure you can intuit where the center of mass is for a square, but we've just proven it here with the definition of our center of mass, that this is indeed going to give us what we intuitively would suspect, that the center of mass is going to be in the center of the square. Um, we could do the same thing in the y direction to calculate the y center of mass. We're going to uh, again choose a strip. This time the strip will be horizontal. And um, we can write down that the y center of mass is 1 over m times the integral of sigma y. And then we need to know how long that horizontal strip is. And we find that by integrating from 0 to L dx. And then multiply by uh, dy. And that's our double integral. And again, you can see already that this is going to give us the same exact result we had for the center of mass up there. Um, this just gives us a factor of L, so sigma L over M times the integral from 0 to L of y dy, which is going to again give us sigma L squared times L over 2M, and that's the same thing we just had up there. So we know that again the answer here is that the center of mass in the y direction is also going to be L over 2, and that the center of mass is at the, is at the point L over 2 by L over 2. In other words, that for a uniform uh, square, the center of mass 
is in the center of the shape. And this is a result that you could repeat over and over and over again for any shape of object, right? If the density of that object is a constant, if it's a uniform density everywhere in that object, then the center of mass of that object will just be in the geometrical center of the object. So here, for instance, my calculator is probably not technically purely uniform mass, but you can see it must be pretty close to uniform mass because it balances pretty much at the geometrical center of the calculator. Pretty much halfway between one end to the other and pretty much along the center of the calculator. So this is pretty close to a uniform distribution of mass and indeed the center of mass is right in the center of the object. So um, one thing that we can take away from this is that if we have an object which is built up or a system which is built up out of simple shapes of uniform mass then we don't actually have to do all this calculus malarkey. We can just take the total mass of each one of those shapes and treat it as if it's just a particle centered at the center, the geometrical center. And indeed, let's look at an example that does just that. So, it says Pluto and Charon. Pluto Pluto's diameter is approximately 2,370 kilometers, and the diameter of its satellite Charon is 1,250 kilometers. Although the distance between them varies, they are on average uh, 19,700 kilometers apart, center to center. Assuming that they have the same composition and the same average density, find the location of the center of mass of this system relative to the center of Pluto. So let's draw ourselves a picture. Here's Pluto over here. Pluto has a diameter, diameter of Pluto, which is 2,370 kilometers. And, oh, is our camera going to catch up with this? Okay. And over here, Charon has a diameter of 1,250 kilometers. And between them, we have 19,700 kilometers on average. The question is, where is the center of mass of this system? Um, well, <coughs> we haven't been told the density of this system, so we're working on some partial knowledge. Uh, we've been told that there, the density is the same in each of these objects, and so to calculate the mass of Pluto and the mass of Charon, we have to know the volume of Pluto and the volume of Charon. So the volume of Pluto, that's going to be uh, 4 thirds pi times the radius of Pluto cubed, right, the volume of a sphere. Well, we don't know the radius, we know the diameter, so let's write this in terms of the diameter. So this is equal to um, 4 thirds pi times, well, diameter is just, or radius is just diameter over 2, so diameter of Pluto over 2 cubed, and that's the volume of Pluto, and therefore the mass of Pluto is just whatever that density is uh, times the volume of Pluto, and so that's going to be uh, 4 pi over 3 times the density rho times uh, dp over 2 cubed. And we could go through exactly 
that same argument for charon. The volume of charon is going to be 4 pi, 4 thirds pi uh, radius of charon cubed. So that's going to be 4 thirds pi times the diameter of charon over 2 cubed. And the mass of charon um, is going to be the density times the volume of charon, which is going to be 4 pi over 3 times rho times diameter of charon over 2 cubed. Okay? And so to calculate the center of mass, we have two objects, one of mass this and one of mass this, located at two positions, x equals 0 and x equals 19,700. All right. So we have the mass of Pluto times zero, the position of Pluto, plus the mass of Charon times the position of Charon. We'll just call this D divided by the total mass of the system. So that's mass of Pluto plus the mass of Charon. So we can plug in, well, this is just zero. That first term goes away. So it's only the second term that matters. So that's 4 pi over 3 times density times the diameter of Charon over 2 cubed times the distance. All right, that's just mass of Charon times distance. And we're going to divide that by the total mass of Pluto plus the total mass of Charon. So that's 4 pi over 3 times density times diameter of Pluto over 2 cubed plus 4 pi over 3 times density times the diameter of Charon over 2 cubed. Right, so the mass of Charon times the distance between R times the position of Charon divided by the mass of Pluto plus the mass of Charon. And you can see here that a whole bunch of things are going to cancel. The 4 pi over 3's all cancel. The densities all cancel. Uh, heck, even these factors of 2 all cancel. Um, and so what we're left with is that the center of mass is equal to diameter of Charon cubed times the distance divided by diameter of Pluto cubed plus the diameter of Charon cubed. And now we can plug in some numbers. So 1250 kilometers cubed times 19,700 kilometers and divided by 2,370 kilometers cubed plus uh, 1,250 kilometers cubed. And now we get, our get out our trusty calculator. On the bottom we got 2,370 <coughs> cubed plus um, 1250 cubed. Uh, take the inverse of that and multiply by uh, 1250 cubed. Oops. 50 cubed. Um, and then multiply again by 19,700. Um, and gives us a center of mass, uh, which is 2,520 kilometers from the center of Pluto. And indeed, we can see that is slightly outside 
of the surface of Pluto. So um, the center of mass of the pluto charon system is uh, just outside of the surface of Charon. Uh, and uh, what that means is that as Charon orbits Pluto, the two of them actually orbit around the common center of mass. And if you uh, are watch the, the Pluto-Charon system carefully, you can tell that Pluto is actually circumscribing a little circular orbit or nearly circular orbit around a position just outside of itself. So here is where uh, the center of mass of our system is. And again, any time we have a system which is made up of uh, shapes that are uniform and easy to calculate the geometrical centers of, then we can kind of take the whole mass of this object and condense it down to the center of that shape, and the whole mass of this object and condense it down to the center of that shape, at least if the objects are of uniform density. Now, in this case, Pluto and Charon are probably not of uniform density. The density probably does change as you descend into the sphere, but also they are pretty close to spherically symmetric, and so it actually still works out that the center of mass is in the centers of those objects, or at least the center of mass of these objects is in the center of those, and we can treat them as if they're just a point mass condensed to their geometrical centers. So, another example of the kind of problem you very often find on introductory physics exams would be something like this, where you're asked to find the center of mass of a slightly odd shape, but one that you can make up by combining regular shapes of some sort. So, for instance, this sort of uh, L-shaped uh, piece could be described as being made up of three squares of uniform density. So if we wanted to calculate where's the center of mass of this L-shaped object, we could break that L-shaped object into three uniform mass squares, and then finding the center of mass comes down to adding up the uh, the three objects individually, as again, again as opposed to having to do any sort of more complicated calculus. So we divide up our uh, bent object into three squares, and we say the total length of that side there is L. I'm going to write that as a capital L. It's a little easier to see. And then we can calculate where the center of mass is. Well, we're going to break this into three uniform squares, and I'm going to say each of these squares has a mass m, and the center of mass of this first square is going to be halfway from here. Well, this is L over 2, so this would be L over 4 by L over 4, and this point over here, well, that's going to, if this is L over 2 and that's L, this is halfway between, or 3L over 4, 3 quarters of the way there. Um, and again, this is just going to be L over 4 for the Y position of that one. And up here, this is going to be 3L over 4 there, and by 3L over 4. So we have three objects, one at L over 4 by L over 4, one at 3L over 4 by L over 4, and one at 3L over 4 by 3L over 4. So, the center of mass, uh, the x-coordinate of the center of mass, is going to be one of these m's times the x-coordinate x, x of the first mass, which is L over 4. Um, I guess I did write that as a lowercase l, L over 4. Um, and the position of the second mass here well, that's going to be this one. That's at 3L over 4. And the position of the third mass, well, that's this one. That's also at 3L over 4. And we're going to take that whole thing and divide by the total mass of our system, which in this case is 1, 2, 3M. Okay. Well, we can cancel a bunch of things. The M's, for instance, all cancel. Um, 
All of these are over 4 and then divided by 3, so this is going to be over 12. And they're all L's, so it's L over 12 times, in this case, there's one of those twelfths plus three of those twelfths plus another three of those twelfths, so one plus three plus three, that's seven L over twelve. And that's the coordinate, the x-coordinate of the center of mass. So seven L over twelve, well this is going to be uh, six L over twelve, so it's going to be just past the halfway point, or somewhere along that vertical line is where the center of mass is going to be. Let's do this for the y co com or coordinate too, the component or the coordinate of the y or the center of mass in the y direction. The y coordinate of the center of mass is again um, this point times its y coordinate, so that's m times l over 4 plus another m at l over 4 on the vertical axis, plus our third mass up here, which is at 3l over 4. And again, that's going to be over the total mass of our system, which is 3m. So again, the masses all cancel, and again we have over 4, then, but then dividing by 3, so it's all going to be over 12 again. So the center of mass will be at L over 12, but now there's one of those plus one of those plus three of those. So 1 plus 1 plus 3, that's 5L over 12 is where the center of mass will be in the y direction. That's 6L over 12 would be again halfway up. So 5L over 12 must be just below halfway. And our center of mass is right there. So the center of mass is at um, the x-coordinate 7L over 12 and the y-coordinate 5L over 12, just inside from that corner section right there. Now, there is a trick uh, that you can sometimes apply with these systems, uh, and it works. Uh, I don't know that I want to go into detail for why it works, but trust me, it works. Remember how we could say that we could divide this up into uh, three smaller objects um, and then find the center of mass of those three smaller objects and then find the center of mass as if we were at we had a system of three smaller objects. Well, we could also interpret this shape as having taken a large square, not of sides L over 2, but of sides L, and subtracted off from that large square a square over here. Or we could think about it as adding a system with negative mass to this other system, so that the negative mass of this corner sort of cancels out the mass of that corner of the bigger box. And it turns out that this is, in fact, mathematically identical to what we just did, but sometimes it's easier to calculate a shape as a bigger shape minus a smaller shape than it is to calculate the shape uh, otherwise. So for instance, uh, let's see, let's, let me illustrate how this works. The center of mass in this, uh, this would then be, we have an object here of mass 4m, and an object here of mass minus m, all right? And the 4m object is centered at L over 2 by L over 2. And the minus m object is centered at L over 4 
by 3L over 4. That's the coordinate of that position. So our center of mass would be 4M at L over 2, the x coordinate of this 4M, minus M at L over 4, divided by the total mass is 4M minus M, it's still 3M. So the center of mass, or the x coordinate of the center of mass is then, um, again, we're going to have quarters being, or fourths being the common denominator on the top, um, divide by 3. So we're going to, again, have 12 um, uh, on the bottom. So L over 12. And of those, we're going to have 8 of them here minus one of them gives us, again, 7L over 12, which is exactly the same answer we just got up there. And if we calculate the center of mass, the y-coordinate of the center of mass, we again have 4M at a position L over 2 minus M at a position of 3L over 4. Again, our total mass here is 4 minus 1 is 3m. Um, and this gives us, again, 12, so l over 12. Um, and we have uh, 8 from this first term minus 3 from the second term is 5l over 12. And that, again, is exactly the same answer we got there. So we could calculate this or we could calculate the center of mass by assuming that we have three identical squares at uh, these three points. Or we could also calculate it by seeing this shape as a full square minus this corner over here. And you can see that mathematically they give you the same answers. And as I said, sometimes it's easier to calculate the subtraction of two shapes than it is to calculate um, uh, them directly. In this case, it's not that much different, but for instance, it's relatively not too painful to figure out where the center of mass of a half circle is. It's not super nice and easy, but it's not too bad. But calculating the center of mass of a half donut is slightly harder, but if we think of this half donut as a, uh, a big half circle minus a smaller half circle, um, then we only have to calculate the center of mass of a half circle, and once we've done that, the rest of this comes fairly straightforwardly. So sometimes uh, this subtraction method can be useful for calculating more complicated shapes in this way. All right, so let me give you a um, uh, a, another uh, slightly more complicated example of uh, the calculus method of calculating the isosceles right triangle, um, just uh, so that you can see how this would work in a shape where the, uh, the limits of integration are slightly more interesting than they are for a square. Um, so here we're going to try and calculate where's the center of mass for a uniform density isosceles right triangle. So the isosceles right triangle is the one where the two sides are the same length here at L and L. And then we have this, ang or this uh, cross piece, which is basically a 45 degree uh, angle line across the uh, opposite side. And if we put the origin of our coordinate system right down there, then uh, this line here is the line y equals l minus x. That's a y, not a g. That's the line y equals l minus x. Um, and so uh, we could think about, again, as we're trying to find the center of mass in the x direction, we're having to add up a whole bunch of little dx's like that, but then to turn the surface density into a mass, we have to add up all the mass along this little dx column. We have to know 
how long that is, well, it's going to be a length y. So the center of mass, or it's going to be this length of, of this line there. So uh, the center of mass and the x, or the x coordinate of the center of mass, again, 1 over m. Um, and we're going to integrate from 0 to l in the x direction of uh, x times the length of that line, or the length between the x-axis and uh, our cross line there. Well, that's uh, the integral from 0 to L minus x uh, of our density dy, uh, again, times dx. Now, again, writing this out as a full double integral is a little bit overkill here uh, for the context of a uh, a constant everywhere in the shape density. But if the shape was actually a function of x and y, you could use this methodology and just have to in keep the, the, the density there inside the integral as you integrated it. In this case, since it's a constant density, we can go ahead and pull it out. Um, and what we get is uh, this integral just gives us L minus x, the inner one. So we have sigma over m times the integral from 0 to L of x times L minus x dx. Um, and we're going to break that up. Uh, go ahead and distribute the x inside and break it up into separate integrals. So sigma over m times the integral from 0 to L of uh, the first is just going to be xL or Lx dx. Um, and the second integral is minus the integral from 0 to L of x squared dx. Both of those integrals multiplied by sigma over m. And again, this is the x-coordinate of the center of mass. Um, <coughs> so sigma over m on the outside. Uh, this integral of x dx turns into x squared over 2. So L x squared over 2 evaluated from 0 to L. And the integral of x squared dx is going to give us x cubed over 3 evaluated from 0 to L. Um, and so that's uh, sigma over m. This first one is L cubed over 2, and this second one is L cubed over 3. And so uh, the whole thing here says that the uh, center of mass, or the x-coordinate of the center of mass, then is L, or sigma L cubed over 6 times m. Now, what's the total mass of this triangle? Well, it's the total area of that triangle. The total area of that triangle is 1 half L squared uh, times the density, sigma, is the mass. And so if we then take uh, and plug this in over here, that gives us sigma L cubed over 6 um, uh, times the 2 shows up on the top and the L squared sigma shows up on the bottom and the sigmas cancel uh, and the L squared cancels 2 of the 3 L's on the top and the 2 over 6 becomes uh, L over 3. So in other words, the center of mass in the x direction is going to be one-third of the way L over 3 uh, across the triangle. Um, if you wanted to find the y-coordinate, we could reconstruct this whole thing. The isosceles triangle is symmetric here in x and y, and we can relatively uh, easily go through this, and I'll leave that as an exercise to you, but you get essentially the same answer at the bottom. 
that the center of mass here <coughs> in the y direction is also L over 3, and that you'd get by going in there, and so there, L over 3 by L over 3, and this is where the center of mass of the isosceles right triangle is. If you have uh, shapes that have position dependent densities or they're slightly more complicated shapes, um, then you can still use this methodology. Um, typically it will involve calculating uh, the total mass for each uh, column in the x direction or for each row, if you will, in the y direction. If the density is changing along a row or a column, then instead of just multiplying by a length, you'll have to integrate that density over that, that row or column. Don't panic, we're not going to give you anything quite that complicated on an exam because, again, this turns very rapidly into a calculus problem more than it is a physics problem. Um, but uh, those of you who are going to be mechanical engineers or civil engineers or things like that, uh, the likelihood of having to calculate a center of mass of a non-uniform density object is pretty high, so uh, eventually you're going to have to get comfortable probably doing this style of calculation. So I wanted to at least uh, run you through what that looks like with a slightly more complicated example. All right, so why do we care? What was the point of this from a physics point of view? I mean, this is a math problem, effectively. Why did we go to all this trouble as a physics or to, do work to, to calculate these things in the context of a physics, um, a physics class? And the, it, it turns out that there are two reasons for doing this. The first of those is that um, this gives us some justification for some of the things uh, that we like to do, or, and, and lets us talk a little bit about um, uh, the motion of systems in terms of the things outside the system and the things inside the system. So let me explain this from a sort of a theory point of view, why center of mass is interesting and important to think about. Um, internal forces, if we have a system, right, if we have a system of objects or particles, <clears throat> which are interacting with each other. So for an in instance, imagine four balls connected by springs or something like that. That's a complicated system interacting with each other and the springs are all interacting. But you take this complicated object and then throw it into the air. So you toss this object like a... Uh, like a um, uh, a projectile, and you throw it into the air, and then gravity is acting on each of the objects and pulling them down and so on. So we have forces internal to the system. Those are the spring forces, if this is our system. Forces internal to that system are the springs and stuff. And by Newton's third law, if we're talking about the forces internal to a system, those forces conserve the momentum of the system. But then we have external forces, like whatever force I use to toss the thing up in the air, or after that, gravity acting on that system. Those are external forces. Those are forces between the outside of the system and the system, rather than internal forces, which are forces just internal to the system. Um, and the total momentum of all the internal forces must the, 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 the internal forces must conserve momentum, right? Because they're acting interior to a system. So we already saw that. Newton's third law requires then that the momentum changes caused by the internal forces can transfer momentum from one ball to another, but they can't change the total momentum of the system. Um, so we can break this system up into a complicated interaction between internal forces, all these springs, and the interaction of external forces of, on 
the composite object of the total mass of the system and the total forces acting externally to the system. And so we have the external forces, the sum of external forces acting on that system is going to be the total mass of the system times the acceleration of the center of mass of that system. Or in other words, that the total momentum of the system is just uh, the momenta of all the individual parts of that system, which is going to give you the momentum of the center of mass of that system, and that the sum of external forces is just going to be the rate of change of the center of mass momentum of the system. So we can treat large objects which are made up of lots of interior pieces, um, and we can treat a car as if it's a dot, right? because there's a whole bunch of complicated forces holding the car rigid, but as long as the car remains the same shape and isn't changing, then we can just calculate the motion of the center of mass of the car under external forces, which is something we've been doing all along. We've been treating large objects that we're translating through space as if they were dots, even though they're not dots. Well, here's the justification for that. What we were actually calculating was the translational motion of the center of mass of those objects. And using Newton's third law and this concept of the center of mass motion, or the center of mass, to justify ignoring all the internal forces at work in that system. Now, the reason this comes up in the context of rotation here is that we've been explicitly ro ignoring rotation. And so the other thing, that, the other complication that comes up when you go from treating this pen like a dot is not only does the pen have some size to it and therefore this piece of the pen might be interacting with this piece of the pen over there, but this is something a, a dot can't do. A dot has no volume, it has no size, and therefore rotation is meaningless for a dot. But we're going to find out real soon next chapter that rotation is not meaningless for large objects. And so when we're talking about the motion of large, er, large uh, objects as opposed to just dots, yes, we can break down the internal forces on that object and the external forces on that object but we also have to account for rotation of that object. Potentially, and this is a little bit of uh, spoiler territory, objects that are fle freely flying through space tend to like to rotate around their center of mass. So we can think about the motion of a complicated motion like this, for instance. Boy, this is hard to do. Complicated motion like that as the translational motion of this object center of mass plus some solid body rotation of that object around its center of mass. So this is a theoretical reason for why it is that center of mass becomes important to physicists. There's also a more practical reason, which is sometimes calculating the center of mass in this way is easier than trying to keep track of all of the uh, forces and momenta and stuff like that involved. And so sometimes there are certain problems where uh, if you can say something about the motion of the center of mass of our object, um, then you might be able to quickly come to a solution which might otherwise uh, be quite a bit trickier. So let me give you an example here. We'll end with this. Give you an example of a problem that is much easier to calculate in terms of its of thinking about center of mass than it is to calculate uh, thinking about uh, momentum and forces and so on. So the problem says a 45 kilogram woman stands up in a 60 kilogram canoe which is five meters long. All right, obviously. Don't do this at home, kids. Standing up in canoes is a bad idea. It will at the very least make you wet, and uh, depending on how well you can swim or where you are in that canoe, it might lead to disaster. Um, so a 45 kilogram woman stands up in a 60 kilogram canoe, which is five meters long. She walks from a point one meter from one end 
of the canoe to a point one meter from the other end of the canoe. If we ignore resistance to the motion of the canoe in the water, how far does the canoe move during that process? So let's think about what's going on physically. So our, our, our hero here is standing up at one end of the canoe, starts to walk, and as she does so, the canoe kind of starts to walk there starts to move the other direction underneath her. So she walks from here to over here. Now, we have been told almost nothing about how this process takes place. We don't know how long she's walking, how fast she's walking. Does she accelerate and then decelerate? Is it instantly moving and then instantly stopping? We know nothing about the kinematics of how this happened. We just know where she started from and where she ended. But if we think about the motion of this, right, if we think about the physics of this, well, why does the canoe move? Well, to walk forward, she has to push backwards with one of her feet. So she pushes backwards and the canoe has to slide under that push. So her foot pushes backwards on the canoe while that shifts her body weight forward that pushes the canoe backward, right? And so um, there's a force interaction, an action-reaction interaction, right? So she pushes backward on the canoe. The canoe pushes forward on her at the same time. There's an action-reaction interaction happening. But this is an internal force between the woman and the canoe, which means that the center of mass of the woman and canoe system isn't changing because there's no external forces on that system, only internal forces on that system. And so the center of mass of the woman in the canoe will be the same before she was or before and after she moved from one end of the canoe to the other. So let's draw this. She's going to we're going to start here and I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, end of the canoe on this red line. There's our canoe. It's five meters long. Um, and I'm going to put her standing up in the boat at a distance of one meter from the end of the canoe. And she has a mass here of MW, the mass of our woman. Now the canoe also has some mass. And the canoe is, we're going to assume the canoe is symmetric here, so that the center of mass of the canoe is just the center of the canoe, right? So here we have the mass of the canoe at a position here of uh, two and a half meters from the end, all right? And that's where she starts. And then after she walks to the other end, so the canoe shifts by some distance. We don't know how long that, how large that distance was. That's what we're trying to calculate. So we're just going to call it a distance L that the canoe moves and she ends up over here one meter from this edge of the canoe. And now her uh, 45 kilograms is over here. And the canoe's mass is again in the middle of the canoe, which is two and a half meters from the edge of the canoe, right? That's where the mass of the canoe is. Um, if she's one meter from this edge of the canoe, that means she must be four meters from that edge of the canoe. Well, the center of mass of the canoe is going to be well, if the canoe was empty, it would be right in the middle, but the canoe's not empty, so it's got to be somewhere in here between the woman and the center of the canoe. And the center of the mass of the canoe afterward also has to be somewhere between the woman and the center of the canoe. So the question is, how big is this L? How far did she move? Well, let's calculate the center of mass up here at the top first. The position of the center of mass is the mass of our woman 
at a location of one or a coordinate of one meter. That's the, where the mass the woman is, plus the mass of the canoe at our location of two and a half meters, divided by the total mass of our system, which is the mass of the woman plus the mass of the canoe. All right, um, so let's go ahead and plug some numbers in. So the mass of the woman, as we said, is 45 kilograms uh, at one meter plus 60 kilograms at two and a half meters divided by the total mass, which is 45 kilograms plus 60 kilograms. So uh, on the top, that's going to be 45 kilogram meters. Kilograms times meters is kilogram meters, all right? Plus 60 times 2.5 is 150 kilogram meters divided by um, 45 and 60 is 105 kilograms. So 45 plus 150 divided by 105 gives us a center of mass position, which is 1.86 meters. So 1.86 meters from the end of the canoe, that's where the center of mass of our canoe is. And it's going to stay there, or the center of mass of our canoe and woman system. And the center of mass is going to stay there even as she walks in one direction and the canoe shifts in the other direction. So even as we switch over to this second position. Now let's calculate the center of mass here. Okay, so the center of mass is again the position. Now the trick is we don't know the position of the woman relative to our origin, we know the position of the woman relative to our canoe. Well, she's four meters from the, the, um, the end of the canoe, and the canoe is, my, end of the canoe is minus L uh, uh, meters from our origin. So the woman is at the position minus L plus four meters. Because this position right here, this is the coordinate minus L. And if we add four meters to that, we end up at the woman. So she's at minus L plus four meters. And the canoe is at minus L plus two and a half meters. And we divide that again by the total mass of our system, the woman plus the canoe. So we can plug in some numbers, but we're going to have to solve here for L eventually. So we say, um, we'll plug in what we can. Um, mass of the woman times L, that's going to give us minus 45 kilograms times L plus 45 kilograms times her mass of 4m minus 60 kilograms times L plus 60 kilograms times 2.5 meters. All of that over our 45 kilograms plus 60 kilograms. Um, so 45 times 4 plus 60 times 2.5. 45 times 4 is 180 plus 60 times two and a half gives us 330, 330 kilogram meters. That's those two terms. 
and then minus, well, 45 and 60, that's going to give us minus 105 kilograms times L. And this comes down over here, also 105 kilograms. And it has to equal the same 1.86 meters. That is, the center of mass of our system hasn't changed. Um, and so, uh, well, we can divide 330 divided by 105. That gives us 3.14 minus L, because 105 divided by 105 is just 1, equals 1.86 meters. So 3.14 meters minus 1.86 meters. gives us 1.28 meters. So in other words, the boat shifted 1.28 meters as she moved from this end to that end. Trying to solve this problem from a kinematics or, or momentum conservation point of view would have been quite tricky. Um, again, we weren't given any information about what, how she accelerated, how she moved from one end of the boat to the other, but we could use momentum conservation and, um, and uh, the idea that since all the forces here were internal to the system, um, that the center of mass wasn't accelerating, and since the center of mass wasn't moving before she moved, the center of mass stood still. So here's a practical reason for using uh, center of mass as a concept, which is um, if you have a system which is only acting under internal forces, then the change, the, the momentum of the uh, system will be conserved, and therefore the momentum of the center of mass of that system will also be conserved, and sometimes that's easier to calculate than the actual momentum interaction between the various parts of the system. All right, so that's what we have for today. Um, this also ends what's going to be covered on exam three. So exam three is going to cover uh, impulse and momentum and collisions and explosions and center of mass, as we've just calculated here. Um, I will probably do uh, a one more uh, uh, lecture here, one more uh, lecture with some examples of things uh, sort of in preparation for that exam. We'll do a few more examples, uh, and I'll put that up, and then we'll start in on rotation after that.